Wow. 600 subscribers. That's actually incredible. I didn't think I would get this far. I only really started talking about Hell's Kitchen just to provide a different opinion of sorts, but if I knew it would get me this far, then I would have brought an actual microphone that doesn't sound like I'm a fly stuck in a room. In all seriousness, thank you so much for this. I really do appreciate the fact you're here listening to me spew my opinions off, even when I deviate from the show to talk about something completely different. In celebration, I think I will start a new series that will hopefully get me back to the swing of things. But what hasn't been done that I'm aware of that is way too ambitious for my ass? Oh. Hello everyone, I'm a turtle opossum, and yes, you read that title right. Today, we're going to be starting a brand new series where I take a look at every single contestant in Hell's Kitchen and rank them from worst to best. What the fuck have I gotten myself into? Alright, before we begin, let's just go over a few notes for these lists. First, I'm only going one season at a time. There are, for my count, 358 different chefs that have participated in the show, and that's not even including chefs who have returned. There's absolutely no way I'll be going into depth on over 300 chefs in one video. I need a reasonable workload. Yes, the other seasons will eventually have their contestants ranked, but for now, just humor me. Second, some of these chefs I may have talked about before, so if there's a chef who I don't really get into too much depth into, chalk it up to me already talking about them, or me not really having much to say about them. Trust me, there's gonna be quite a few of these. Third, and this is more of a precaution, any jokes I make at the expense of any chef in these videos, they're really just that. They're just jokes and nothing meant to be taken seriously. I don't know any of these people in real life, and so I can't really judge them on a personal level. For all I know, someone like Jason Underwood could be doing charity work if he know for working on a cure for cancer. Okay, obviously he's not, but you know what I mean. Finally, and this might be a bit controversial, but to add on to what I said above, I may reference some stuff that happened outside of the show, but they really won't play much of a role in terms of ranking. Now let's get into the criteria, and really it's more or less the same as my other videos. Pretty much I'll be ranking them on how much entertainment value I get out of them, if I like their story, if I think they went at the right time, stuff like that. Cooking may play a bit of a role in their placement, but don't expect me to go into depth. With that out of the way, let's start off with Season 1. Season 1's cast as a whole is actually quite interesting in terms of basic overview, because if you look at the occupations of some of the participants, you'll see that there's only four actually trained chefs there. The reason for this is because the initial goal of Hell's Kitchen was to mold someone off the streets into a head chef. Sort of like Worst Cooks in America, but with less of... this. I feel you with the, the pasta. I'm a you pasta get lover. Me. I do have her like this concept because I think it does make some of the cast relatable on the surface, even if overall this cast doesn't really do much for me. Not that I dislike them or anything. Okay, well, there's at least one I dislike. Three guesses on who that is. But it's just that compared to a lot of chefs that come after, a lot of them are just kind of boring. Half of the ones I do like, I think they do stand out. Anyways, let's begin. You're an asshole. Well, what better way to start off this list than with the first chef that people will look at and say, Damn, that guy sucks. I hope he doesn't win. Jeff is put on the right team and, much like a lot of the talent that season, he sucks. But he'll say that he should be blamed for it, for you see, he doesn't have much experience. This is an excuse that falls flat when you realize that 1. Only 3 chefs on the red team are actual chefs, yes, Dewberry counts, and 2. One of those non-chefs are actually pretty solid, all things considered. He spends pretty much all of his time whining and looking for sympathy, even to the extent he tried bringing up the fact he had a kidney stone. Which, I mean, as a guy, I get it. Of course, what he's best known for was calling Ramsey an asshole and rage quitting. And the fact that Ramsey says he's been called worse tells you all you need to know about him. At the end of the day, not good by any stretch, since him whining does get annoying, but compared to a lot of other chefs who come later in the series, he's pretty much inoffensive. No, continue no. talking trash about me, I like it. Fans of Flynn Masters will remember that he labeled Mary Ellen as the most forgettable chef of season 1, and I won't disagree. Despite being the fourth boot, Mary Ellen got so little focus throughout the season that I barely remembered she was there. Really the most focus she got was in her boot episode, where she was eliminated over Andrew after screwing up on the appetizers. 
Oh, she also had a friendship with Jessica, I guess. Yeah, that's about it. This lady knows how to cook chicken. You know, for our first food of the entire series, especially for a season that has like four actually trained chefs, you'd expect the first food to be eliminated for doing something so monumentally stupid. Like picking their nose, eating the food, being Raj. But no, Carol Ann is just the first boot. And that's really all she has. To say she doesn't have substance to her, I think, however, is incorrect. She has a solid signature dish, in fact, one of the few dishes that actually did good. Hell, when it comes to service, the only thing she really did wrong was not help her team. And yet, she was eliminated over three other chefs that felt more like your average first boot. Theoretically, I feel like there could have been more to her. I mean, the fact that she's a successful actress could mean she could have some entertainment value, but as she doesn't get a whole lot of time, that means she just comes off as pretty boring. As the saying goes, the crime of being boring is not of her own, but the way things be. I thought cold water was supposed to boil faster than hot water. I have no idea why, but I have a bit of enjoyment of Wendy. I have no clue why. If someone could pick around my brain to figure out why, I'd greatly appreciate it. Out of everyone on the blue team, Wendy was easily the weakest chef there, only making it to the top 10 because she was on the winning team, and Ramsey didn't figure out he could just eliminate whoever you wanted yet. Throughout her stay, she was characterized as a massive ditz, making several stupid decisions that I feel would make your average Twitter user say, I may be an idiot, but at least I'm not Wendy. Obviously, the moment to bring up just how brain dead she was was how she thought cold water boils faster than hot water, and I mean... You think by just how logic works, you think that maybe warm water would boil faster? Crazy assumption, but maybe she missed that physics class. Yeah, that's about it for her. Just a ditz I have a bit of a soft spot for. Not enough to get it higher, but yeah. No, no, dirty ball. So, yeah, Jimmy is, uh, well, how do I describe him in the nicest way possible? He's constantly screwing up in the kitchen, making stupid mistakes like grabbing hot meat with his bare hands instead of using tongs like a normal person. Hell, I personally would say he had the potential to be the first boot that made a lot more sense, something that's even lampshaded by him in the first episode. Despite this, he manages to avoid nomination the first two times his team lose, and next two times he's lucky enough to be on the winning team. Around the final eight, he forms a friendship with Michael after he switched over, which becomes pretty much his salvation. After losing another dinner service and Jimmy apparently having a love for dirty bowls, as well as touching himself, but I'm not gonna help you with that context, he once more skates by after Michael sends up Chris instead of him. After winning one more service, Jimmy ends up making the black jackets. Yes, this is the closest we're gonna get to Raj making black jackets, although he's nowhere near as entertaining. Shockingly enough, Jimmy, in addition to making it to the black jackets, despite having as many good services as a long jawed silver gang customers on a daily basis, Actually wins the first black jacket challenge. Things are looking up for him. And then he shits the bed during service again. And this time Michael can't save him. Yeah, Jimmy is obviously one of the worst black jackets in history, even for a season that's primarily filled with untrained chefs. That being said, I can't admire him for not giving up, although that's pretty much the equivalent of a participation trophy. He's got issues. Dewberry is one of the few actual chefs in the competition but for the way he performs, you really wouldn't know it. Placed on the red team, Dewberry's one of the weaker chefs on the first night, and honestly, I don't even think he deserved to go. Anyways, after he's put up, he seems to be on track for a rivalry of sorts with Elsie because Elsie put him up when she promised him she wouldn't. Only for them to hug it out and say it's all good. The next episode, however, he does pretty well on the appetizer station, but after he switched to the meat station, he completely fumbles the bag. He messes up on meat to the extent the customers order a pizza to the restaurant, and then Mr. Music Degree gets angry and the services shut down. Oh, and Dewberry nearly quits, but doesn't because he realizes that would be stupid. Well, too late, because he's eliminated later that night. Funnily enough, over Jeff, who we all know how that went. He later returned for the finale, and I think this is where Dewberry really does shine. After feeling a bit faint from the heat, he takes a bit to cool down, but he doesn't quit. He wants to get free service. And then we get this iconic line. I'd rather you be saying I was Brad Pitt's wife. Admittedly, Dewberry is someone that, in the grand scheme of things, I don't really have too much of an opinion about because he doesn't stay for very long. So I can't justify putting him higher even if his final service is a highlight. 
However, compared to many of the others this season who are about as noble as the landscape of Arizona, I find more enjoyable than quite a few of them. So it sucks, I'm a little bitter. <laughs> you know, I'm definitely bummed. I think here is what I like to call the median point of the list, where it marks the divided point between rankings where my feelings on chefs is either negative or a little lacking, and the chefs I actually like in this season. As the third placer of the season, Jessica is actually known for quite a few things. The first confessional in the show's history, the first chef to be named best of the worst more than once, and the first chef to remind Ramsay of good hydration habits by presenting her signature dish. Being placed on the blue team, Jessica is initially one of the stronger chefs on the team despite not being an actually trained chef, being one of the most consistent chefs in service, while challenge-wise, she's about as strongly constructed as your average YouTuber apology. Regardless, she is, in Ramsey's words, consistently average, and considering that many of the chefs before her are consistently shit, that means she does make the black jackets. From then on, oh boy does she begin to crash and burn. She screwed up in the two Black Jacket services, only surviving due to being placed up against Jimmy the first time around, and the second time because Elsie was left to suffer on her own. In the end, Jessica would technically be the first chef eliminated in the final free elimination challenge after getting the least amount of votes for a chicken dish. By her family, no less. Man, that's... Ouch. The strange thing is that despite Jessica really doing a lot throughout the season, such as being strong in servers, former friendships with Ralph and Mary Ellen, and even joining in on the Elsie hate bandwagon, I feel pretty neutral on her overall. She does immediately reach the bigger heights than a lot of other chefs this season, which is why she's ranked pretty high overall. However, don't expect her to be that high when it comes to overall rankings. He keeps on calling me Jean-Pierre. I'm not gonna lie, for the longest time, I had very little inclination to really give that much of a damn about Ralph. I mean, compared to a lot of chefs, he just seemed kind of, I don't know, bland. Hell, I think I would have found more interesting post-show, considering the wild adventures he's got himself into. However, upon rewatching the season, I think I gained a bit of a new appreciation for Ralph. Because Ralph is, by and large, the most chef, chef of the season. I mean, think about it, he doesn't go to massive lows unlike some other chefs, his whole shtick is cook good food and win, he's pretty much the basic standard of modern day Hell's Kitchen in a way. Hell, even when he's being sabotaged, he doesn't really make a big fuss about it, and he just keeps doing what he's doing. I think a good place to really show off this point is his final service, where he actually does pull off a genuinely solid one with Andrew, Brad Pitt's wife, and the girl who failed physics. He even prioritized the well-being of his team over the restaurant as seen with Dewberry. That's not even to mention the other stuff he's done, like have a rivalry with Andrew throughout the season, and have a bit of a running gag with JP calling him Jean-Pierre. Admittedly, I do think what keeps him from getting further is just, I think the other chefs ahead of him have done a bit more. Nothing against him, it's just the others appeal more to me. I would rather be on a team of dishwashers. At least they, they know how a kitchen works. Alright, we're finally on to the chefs that I do actually kind of enjoy for the most part, starting off with our executive chef in Chris. Chris actually does have somewhat of a little storyline throughout the season. As one of the few executive chefs this season, he's automatically coming in with an advantage, something he spends absolutely no time letting others know. Despite being labeled as a plank by Ramsay and having an ego, Chris starts out as one of the stronger chefs. Although again, it's because he's a chef compared to many others who aren't. The second episode, however, once he steps into a leadership position, he does lose much of the attitude actually proves far more affable with his team, even becoming best of the worst that episode. He also becomes one of the people to call out Jeff's shit behavior after he accidentally burns Elsie in the third episode. After he has a performance that really isn't too bad, he's sent out by Michael info Elsie had her issues that night and Jimmy was Jimmy. He ends up being sent home for not living up to his executive chef position even though he kinda did. Chris honestly is someone who I think is pretty underrated in the grand scheme of things, all things considered. And I don't think enough people really take into account on how nonsense this elimination really was. I think it's because Michael's stunt is so well known and pretty much groundbreaking that it's easy to forget how bullshit that elimination really was. Look, I know Elsie's cool and all, and I still think it's hilarious that Jimmy not only made the Black Jackets, but also won the first ever Black Jacket Challenge. But honestly, I think it's a shame because I feel like Chris definitely could have had more to offer. I'm not saying he could win, no way, his record of challenges speaks for itself. But imagine his arrogance start to grind on his team's nerves, or him being against the idea of sabotaging Elsie in the Final Four. Who knows what could happen? 
Sadly, we will never know. I've just never been through anything this stressful in my life. I bore kids. It wasn't this bad. It's time to talk about the first fan favorite in the show's history, Elsie, who's probably best known nowadays for Adopty.com believing she was fucking murdered. Elsie's background is one that is automatically catchy, being a mother of six, and on top of that, she ends up having one of the few signature dishes that are actually well received in the form of turkey tacos, which, fun fact, are actually in the Hell's Kitchen cookbook. Pretty nifty, I'll have to give them a try once I care enough. Anyways, with a signature dish that good, it's no surprise she winds up being one of the early picks to win, with her receiving best of the worst in the first episode and being the first overall to receive that distinction. From then on, she continues to do pretty well the odd mistake here or there, but she does end up in the Black Jackets. However, the Black Jackets mark a noticeable turn in how the rest of the chefs treat her. Starting out with her feeling homesick, which, I'm not gonna lie, I think that might piss off a few competitors. Crazy theory, I know. But then she manages to win a challenge in the Final Four and makes the mistake of bragging about it on live TV. Okay, yeah, you can't blame her, but it turns out that some modesty goes a long way. Because during service that night, everyone else lets Elsie sink like the Titanic. And yet, when she has the opportunity to call about for like her fall, she... Doesn't? She's also the last pick for Michael's team, Yaya. Yeah. Look, I like Elsie. I think she's pretty cool, all things considered. But just... Why did she not call them out? Seriously, Ramsey, point blank, asked Elsie if she got any help. You are literally being handed... No, presented! A get out of jail free card, and you don't take it? If I were in her shoes, I call everyone out for not having my back, Jessica for serving wood to a customer, and Ralph for not conducting a welfare check on his hairline. My best guess as to why she didn't call him out is because she wanted to leave earlier, but even then, that's just a stretch because that's not even mentioned in this episode. That was mentioned in the episode beforehand and barely brought up. Aside from that, I think Elsie's pretty solid overall. Classic underdog who worked hard, what else is there to say? important lesson I've learned is when you're facing the devil in Hell's Kitchen, shut your fucking mouth. Oh boy, now this is going to be interesting. Andrew pretty much makes his first impressions pretty damn clear after being the first chef to present his signature dish, which also pretty much speaks for itself. It's called Andrew's Absolute Penne. Andrew's Absolute Penne. Correct. Throughout the season, Andrew is pretty much set up as the sort of antagonist of the season. Bun heads with chefs like Jessica, Ralph, and especially Chef Ramsay, constantly believing things are not his fault, trying to make himself look better, and pretty much being unpleasant to deal with. He even gets nominated twice in a row because of how terrible his attitude is. And also because he's kind of shit in the kitchen, but then again, so is a lot of chefs this season. Come the fifth episode, however, Andrew seems to get it through his head that he's being a massive tool, and from then on, he genuinely makes an effort to improve himself. He tries his best not to fight with his team, and even tries to benefit them by... Cheating. Yeah, not the best idea. Unfortunately, while his attitude does improve a bit, he's still pretty shit in the kitchen. And after he's given the blame for Ralph's halibut dish sick in the kitchen, he gets the boot right before the blackjack is. His story doesn't end there, however, as after return for the final service, Andrew probably has not only his best performance of his time on the show, but out of everyone who came back that season. It's also on Ralph of all people's team in the finale, the guy who he fell through under the bus. He genuinely puts in a great effort for Ralph, even after getting his finger cut and even manages through Dewberry Station after he feels faith for the heat. Honestly, I think Andrew might be one of the more underrated chefs from a personality standpoint. Yeah, he does start off pretty terribly like a lot of Hell's Kitchen antagonists, but he does something I very rarely see these antagonists do. Actually take note of their attitude and not only try to improve on it, but actually stick with it by the end of the season. I think that puts Andrew in a genuinely interesting camp that only a few chefs are in. And for that, I not only appreciate it, but respect it. You guys cook like old people fuck. Yeah, there is really no other chef that could take the top spot of this list. As I mentioned in my winners list, Michael is essentially a very unique winner. From the very start, Michael was set up as a sort of protagonist in a way being one of the more consistent chefs of the blue team, and continuing to be strong upon being switched to the red team. As such, he won nearly every service, and the one service he lost, he was the best of the worst, so pretty much he was bound to make the black jackets. To add on to his uniqueness, there were a few scenes that showed him being awake late at night talking to himself, pretty much cementing himself as the most protagonist protagonist to ever protagonist. 
yet he does show a more cutting side to him. And yes, the go-to is looking at what he did to Chris, but there are other times he messed with the other chefs. He didn't help out Elsie when she needed it, and he made Ralph look stupid after he gave him a risotto with no crap in it. A decision that pretty much inspired the run in the past segment of the competition. Yeah, honestly, I don't think I can say that much more about Michael because really, what else can I say that I haven't said before? He's just a very unique winner whose comfort strategy helped Hell's Kitchen reshape itself into what we see today, and one of my favorite winners. So yeah, Season 1's cast, kind of meh overall. There's highlights there, but at least half the cast I don't really feel anything for. That being said, let's take a look at overall rankings. FTR chefs I dislike, DTR chefs who I feel really nothing about, Z tier is a more variety category, they can be chefs who I have some opinions about, but don't really have much of an interest in in the long run, chefs who I feel could have more, had they gotten further, or I'm mixed on overall. B tier are chefs who are good, but not enough to reach A tier, A tier are chefs that I do like with only a few problems, or they just aren't enough to make S tier, and S tier are chefs that I love. That out of the way, here's the overall rankings for Season 1. <laughs> and that'll be it for Season 1. I'll see you next time for Season 2. Turtle Possum, out.